Madonna. Uh, so, without further ado, I present to you Juan Caicedo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Hi, so, everybody. So, so when I had to, I had to ask you. Um, yeah. You, you told us about uh, something really special about your your socks. You have to kind of share that. Yeah. With us. So I'm actually wearing brand new ones. I got these ones from Lori yesterday. These are new MPM socks. Yeah. I had an old pair of MPM socks, and they're like getting a little old. So now I got a new pair. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with Thank us. Thank you Love for asking, socks. yeah. All right, have a uh, good time. Another like, quick clarifying thing. I actually, I mostly like Daft Punk's newest album, but when I say that I like it, I mean like I listened to it two times yesterday while I was working on my slides. So I really, really like it. Uh, and thank you all for coming today. And I, it means a lot for me that you're here because my fellow web developers, I, I'm angry. And I am angry because for years, us JavaScripters have been told to never, ever, ever, ever use switch statements. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's reasons all over for it. And today I'd like to talk about some of those. Particularly, I'd like to, to recap a bit of that, that awful tragedy, tragedy and then talk about the, the brave web developers who've come before us and the ways that they've come up with skirting around switch statements. And then I'd like to introduce you to a TC39 proposal for a new incarnation of switch statements that would leverage pattern matching inside of JavaScript. So with all that being said, uh, my name's Juan Casado. I am a Canadian Colombian American developer, and I am working for a company called Testable, which is a consulting company where we go to other people's teams and we help them write nice code and we try to be nice about writing code. And we try to help people be nice to each other about writing code. I really like playing guitar and speaking four languages and traveling. So if those are all things that you're into, come chat with me about it sometime. Here is a picture of me. Then here's a picture of me as a child. Here's a picture of me with bleach blonde hair. And here is a picture of me that my coworkers drew at our company retreat last week. I'm not sure why, so I'm wearing a Columbia soccer jersey. I also have my guitar, but I'm Abraham Lincoln, which <laughs> Which makes sense, right? We're both seven feet tall. We're very similar people, all in all. And so let's get back to switch statements. So what is wrong with switch statements? Why shouldn't we use them? Well, if you believe Google, there's approximately 903 million reasons why we shouldn't reuse them. My personal favorite of them is that switch statements are evil. So. I had honestly, I'd heard this when I started programming that we should avoid switch statements in JavaScript. And I didn't have a lot of reasons why until I started researching for this talk and really putting this together. And morality of switch statements aside, the main reasons I could find were two. The first revolves, so here's just a basic switch statement. It's a function that takes in a number and then it switches over that number and just has three cases for the possible values of it. Each one logs out the, the word of that number you've passed in. If none of them match, we hit a default statement. So the main reason, uh, the main of two reasons I could find for why people say not to use switch statements, one is about their syntax. So in JavaScript, almost all types of control flow we do has braces, curly braces for matching them. Case is one of the very few things that uses colons, and because of that, people get really upset, so not good. If, in case you're ever designing a language, avoid colons. The other one that I could find is one that I find a lot more of an actual complaint, which is that case statements have kind of tricky semantics. So inside of a case after you've matched, you have to be sure to explicitly break out of that case. Uh, so for example, in this example, if you Say you have the number one, we're gonna hit the console.log for one, and then we're gonna break out of it. So that's good. However, if we don't do that and we do the two or the three, so what's gonna happen here is that when we enter the case statement for the two, we're gonna log out two. However, then execution is gonna continue, and it's also gonna log out the value for three and the value for default. 
because since none of those have told JavaScript to exit out of the switch statement, it's just gonna match all of those cases even though the number isn't three and it, it's already been matched. So this is something that I think definitely could lead to some unexpected bugs and is, is worth avoiding switch at least to avoid these type of headaches. So how do people manage to avoid switch statements? What else do we use? So I found two main techniques. The first is to use nested ternary statements. So ternary statements are if else, they're this question mark colon operator. So what that does is that it first evaluates the condition on the left. So we would evaluate whether the number is equal to one. And then if that evaluates to true, we execute the second statement. However, if it evaluates to false, then we would evaluate the statement after the colon. So what this technique does is it just does a chain of them so that if the first condition doesn't match, then you evaluate the second condition. If that doesn't match, you evaluate the third condition. And it works and my main issue with it is that I think that it looks okay when you put it like this, but it's relying on some code style that isn't very normal in JavaScript. In JavaScript, this just isn't how we would indent things. So I took this function and I ran it through Prettier, which I think for most of us is kind of like the industry standard on how to format code nowadays. And it comes out as something more like this. And here you can really see that like it's not as straightforward of a statement as we were looking at it before. This also to me highlights one other thing that I'm no performance expert, but I have the feeling that this isn't very performant code because to hit the default statement, you would actually end up going through and one by one evaluating all of the statements above it. So this type of deep nesting is not something that won me over. So the next approach that I found is one that I'm more of a fan of. So this is to use an object literal, which is very common in JavaScript and idiomatic, and use that to control all of our cases. So we would have an object, here I called it the values object, and you would have a key on that for all of the different cases that we could match, and then the value from that is what we would want to return. So then at the bottom what we would do is just take the type that we've passed in, and then we would pull out a value from this object that we've defined before, and then we'll return that. If we've passed in a type that isn't one of the cases that we're set up to handle, then we're gonna get an undefined value back from that object, which is falsy, so then what we can do is go ahead and get the default value and return that instead. So this works. Uh, I have a little bit of a gripe with the fact that we have to explicitly call a default statement. To me, it seems a little weird, but maybe I'm just nitpicking here. I think a concern that is much more valid is that if any of the cases have a falsy value, so uh, false, null, undefined, then when you pull them out of the object and run them through this or check for the default value, they would evaluate to false. So then we would return the default. And you're all probably smarter than me, but I would hit a bug here for sure. So I'm not 100% not on this approach. Uh, yeah, value falsy, not good. So then uh, we would hit this default statement. So then let's look at another example. So this is where I think switch statements are most used in JavaScript today, which is inside of Redux reducers. So inside of this simple example, uh, sorry, to back up, if any of you haven't used Redux, in Redux, uh, a common pattern, like how Redux reducers work, is that it's a function that takes a state and it takes some instructions about how to update that state and then the function is in charge of calculating all of the possible, like the updates to that state and returning back a new state. So here we have a counter, you know, the counter would be a number and then we can either increment that, decrement that or reset it. So what we would do is that in Redux you have an action and an action has a type which tells you how to go through this update statement. So if that type is increment, we would push up our state. If it's decrement, we would push it down. If it's reset, we would return zero. And then if for some reason it's not any of those predetermined ones, we wanna just keep the state the way it is. So there's a, there's a tricky uh, thing here, which is, well, so let's take the switch statement and first let's switch it over to this object approach that we were discussing before. So if we were to do that, what we would do is cut out that switch statement, have an object that's all of the different cases, 
So it has a key for all of the different types of actions, and then on the right hand, it has the how we wanna update the state. Then at the bottom, we would go ahead and pull out that case, or we would return the default. So here, we run into a uh, concern, which is, uh, to illustrate it a little more, let's think about what if we could change, instead of always updating or decrementing by one, what if we can make that an arbitrary amount? So now, the amount that we're gonna increment or decrement by is also gonna flow in with this action. So here, at the very top, we have uh, just a little bit of destructuring. If it's not something you're familiar with, we'll talk about it a little later. So we're gonna reach into that action and we're gonna pull out the type of the action. We're also gonna pull out the data of the action. And as we do that, we'll rename it to the amount. Then inside of our cases, what we wanna do is increment state by the amount and decrement state by amount. So here we run into a bug. And the bug is that if we're in the case of reset, all we wanna do is reset the state to zero. So we're not incrementing or decrementing by any amount. So it would make perfect sense for amount to be undefined. However, as soon as we hit this Kate statement definition, as soon as we call this function, we're eagerly gonna evaluate what state plus amount means. And that means that we're either gonna get state plus undefined, state plus null, state minus null. This is bad, I, I didn't run this to be sure, but I'm pretty sure this would result in your program just blowing up. So the way to avoid this is that instead of just having cases that return a value, we would instead make the cases return a function. So that when you evaluate the function, at that point, we do that math, and this would make sure that when you hit the reset case, it hasn't evaluated the other two cases, and it would avoid this bug. So this means that, you know, at the bottom now, we're gonna be having to call, we'll pull out our case from the object, and then we'll have to evaluate it. And we'll do that again for the default case. And this isn't, I mean, it's not terrible. It just seems to me like a lot of ceremony for something that a language could and should be able to handle for you. And a lot of languages do. So let's backtrack now and talk about a couple other ones. So here's, for example, Elm. Uh, Elm is a language that embraces switch statements a lot. In fact, so much so that in Elm it's considered a code smell to use an if statement or any other type of evaluation if a case would do. So here uh, in Elm an, uh, an action is a data type and the data type would be one of a bunch of different cases. Then when a case could involve with it some data attached to it. So here, when we're in the increment case, we'll automatically get another bit of data with it, which is the amount. And when we hit the reset case, reset has no amount, so it just wouldn't be a part of that data type at all. In Rust, there's something very similar. So we would have an action, which is a struct, which has two different uh, type and an amount defined on it. And then we would have a function that matches over that type and then lets you do different stuff based on it. If you actually know any Rust, don't look at this too closely, because I don't, and I have a feeling this actually doesn't compile. <laughs> and then the one that we're gonna focus on the most is Elixir. The reason why we're gonna do that is because Elixir has the closest semantics out of these languages to JavaScript. So in Elixir, we would define a function, the function would take a state and an action, we would case over that action, and then if it matched whether we wanted to increment, decrement, or reset, we would do, we would take the amount, calculate a new state based off of it. And this leaves us with a question of if all these other languages have a way of doing robust handling of cases, why can't we have something like that in JavaScript? So uh, at this point I actually wanna take a quick intermission to show off my water bottle for all of you because uh, I'm super proud of my water bottle. Uh, we were talking about it backstage actually. I have all of these stickers from different conferences that I've gone to, and some of them, like this one for example, is the, the most famous soccer player in Colombian history, but it's actually the MPM Wombat dressed up as him. So this is fantastic, and if I were to lose this water bottle, I'm really confident that I'd never be able to get this sticker again. So uh, if you have a lot of stickers and don't know what to do with them, I really encourage you to find other things that aren't your laptop to put them on, because. I'm a little too anxious to put them on my laptop, but my water bottle is now my favorite object. 
So with that little intermission to kind of give you all a breath of fresh air, let's talk about JavaScript. So why can't we have this in JavaScript? Because we can, actually. So there's right now a proposal in front of TC39 that's reached stage one for introducing pattern matching into JavaScript. So what pattern matching would be doing is it would be taking a uh, semantic close to what we have for, for switch statements now, but then it would be taking all of the semantics of destructuring and it would be filling them into that language feature. So let's take a step back and let's talk about what I just mentioned about destructuring. So destructuring is a feature you can use whenever you're defining variables with like const or vars. And what it allows you to do is that it allows you to not just define a simple variable by variable on the left, value on the right, but to actually do some logic as you do that. So in this simple case, on the right hand side, we have an object and the object has an X property and a Y property. Then when we create a variable, we can use the curly brace object syntax on the left hand side and what we can tell it is, go ahead and make two new variables for me, X and Y, and make the value of each of them equal to the value of that property in the object on the right. And this is really cool because it's, uh, so if we were to do this, we would get like, uh, we would just have like a, a easier way to pull things out of objects. We can also do other things on top of it, like we can do default values. So here what we're doing is that when we define these variables, we can give them default values. So we can say that the default value for X, if we don't find it on the right hand side, will be the poop emoji, and the value for Y will be the ghost emoji. So the, the results of this is interesting. So the object on the right does have both of these properties, but for the first one, the value of X is undefined. So to back up, if we were to ask for a variable that isn't in that object at all, let's say we were asked for a Z, then Z pulled out of that object would be undefined, so we would get its default value. With X, even though the X property does exist, because its value is undefined, we'll also get the default value. However, this isn't the case for Y. Because Y has a value of null, we will actually get that value out of the destructuring, but I'm gonna convince you that this is actually a good thing, it's not a, a problem. Other things that you can do with destructuring, it's not just for objects, you can do it with arrays. So what we can do is we can go ahead and define X and Y to the first and second values of an array just by applying the same array syntax on the left. This is really cool, it allows you a way of doing a uh, much easier variable assignment. It also allows you to ignore parts of an array as you're pulling stuff out. So let's say that we only care about the second value, we don't care about the first. All we can do is leave in the assignment, we'll leave the first slot open and then have the second slot. Then we're never gonna pull anything out for that JSConf string. Instead, we're only gonna pull out the second value into the Y. This also allows you to do really cool things like to leverage rest argument, or sorry, I get confused with this. So spread is when you're, you have an array and you're spreading it apart. Here what we're doing is rest arguments. So let's say that we have an array with four things in it. We're gonna take the first out of it and put it into a variable X. But then this triple dot syntax, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take all the rest of the contents of that array and it's gonna put them together into the variable rest. So now we have one variable of the first and another variable which is the entire tail. This is really cool. And so having covered all of that for destructuring, let's talk about how this would fit into the pattern matching proposal. So here is the update state or the update counter that we discussed earlier with Redux handlers and how we would do this if we had pattern matching available. So we will do a case statement and the case statement will switch over the type of the action. Then the proposed semantics right now have this new keyword when and with when you would put the value that you wanna match against next to it and then an arrow and afterwards whatever you wanna do. So here it'd be saying that if the type of action directly matches the string increment, then we can go ahead and evaluate the state with plus one. So this is, this is cool. However, that's not where we stop. So because we can use all of this destructuring semantics, we can go ahead and just case over the entire action. When we case over the action, we can on the right hand of then do a destructuring. So we can say that if the action 
has a type property, and that type property matches the string increment, then what we want to do is pull out the property data, but rename that to amount. And now the variables that we've defined inside of that destructuring are available to the other side of that arrow. So we can just go ahead and say state plus amount, which we've received from that destructuring. This is really cool, and we can do it with arrays as well. So another way to do this would be that we could do a case statement over a new array, and the array could have the type of the action and the data of the action, and then all we would do is we would match against the first value being increment, and then we would just put the second value into a variable amount. We could do that the same with decrement, and this is a case, another one that I skipped over before, but when we get to the bottom, we're doing variable assignment. So any variable that we put here will get assigned into there. So the effect of this, of this when underscore, is the same effect as a default case. So what we'll do is we'll say, if we get to this point in the function and we haven't matched any previous case, whatever we've put in the case will just instead be assigned into this variable and we'll match this instead. So this is a really cool, really easy way to do default arguments, or to do default cases. Other places where this could apply could be in Node.js. So in Node, a really common thing is to have error backs or error first callbacks. So here we could be reading a file. We pass the first argument as the name of the file, the second is the encoding we want to read out of. And then inside of our callback, we could do a case statement over the error that we could possibly get back and the contents. So here the first step that we would do is we could say if the error is explicitly null, which is idiomatically what you always get back in Node, then we can go ahead and match this case because we know that the error is null and therefore we have some data, we can do stuff with it. Then in the next statement what we could do is, all right, if the error isn't null and we have an error, let's go ahead and pull that out and then we'll do some error handling, something went wrong. And then we could have another statement after that saying, for some reason, the error isn't null, but it's also not a truthy value, so something went wrong here. I think that case would actually be impossible in Node unless someone explicitly returned false to you, I guess is the only way that it would happen. Um, but yeah, it's cool that basically we could take a part which is very idiomatic in Node and done everywhere, but handle it in, uh, in a really nice, concise new way. This could also be used in JSX, which is actually one of the motivating examples. I don't know how many of you have tried to, in JSX, do any type of conditionals, but you have to do, you have to return something, and usually you do a condition and, and the value that you want to return, and if you want to do ternaries, then you have to do the condition, question mark, and do a few of them. If you have multiple cases, there's no nice way to do that. You have to do the nested ternaries. So here what it would look like is that we could have a component, and let's say that the component inside of its props could either be in a loading state, or it could have some errors, or it could have none of those, and then it just gives you the data back. So instead what we would do is we would just do a case over the props, and we would tell it how to handle each of those and what to return in each of those cases. Uh, I encourage you to write the same example in JSX, and then see what you think about this proposal afterwards, because this, this is super nice. So, Having talked about all of that, let's talk about where pattern matching is. Because like I mentioned, it, it's not reality right now. So right now, it's a proposal in stage one of TC39. So stage one is that it's been evaluated, it's been talked about, and it's interesting enough that TC39 is interested in pursuing, uh, pursuing it more and figuring out what it would take to make this a part of the language. So this means that the semantics are being discussed a lot more, all of the edge cases are trying to be identified so that we can define how would this fit into the language. Uh, what's really cool, I didn't know a whole lot about this until researching this talk, TC39 is a GitHub organization. And basically all of the documents that go into the language that all of us use are just documents on GitHub. So the, the repository for pattern matching is right now just some readme files that you can go through, you can in your head kind of say, oh, what, what would it mean in this case? What would it mean in this other case? You can open up issues saying, I'm not sure it would work the way that I would expect it in here. What does that mean? So this means that right now, contributing to the proposal is really easy. It's all just thought experiments. 
The next step after this would be to figure out how to actually play around with it and how to get it in the wild. So right now, I'm gonna skip to the bottom. Uh, there's this library called Sweet.js, which enables you to do macros, so basically to extend the JavaScript language however you want. I generally don't think the macros are a good idea, but they're fun and they enable you to play out with things like that before, with this before they're ready. So Sweet.js right now has a macro that enables you to do this style of pattern matching. It's actually where a lot of the inspiration for this proposal comes from. There's also in the works a Babel plugin that is gonna enable you to use this syntax and try it out. So if this all sounds interesting, there's a couple different things you can do. One is you could go to TC39 and follow the pattern matching repo. Then whenever anything happens there, you'll be notified of it. Two is that you can find the pull request for the Babel plugin and then follow that. I can tweet out a link to that so that if that's what you're interested in, you can just follow that pull request and see what's happening there. And the last option would be, uh, I'm doing another talk about this in Argentina in October. So if you just follow me, uh, this is my Twitter handle, I'll be tweeting out a lot more about it and I can be sure that you get all the information about pattern matching that you could want. So if that sounds interesting, uh, I have my blog that I put some stuff up on. Uh, the company that I work for, Testable, also has a ton of great articles on our, our blog. I encourage you to go look at both of them. Here's a picture of me and my sister during the World Cup wearing our Columbia jerseys because we're very patriotic. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I work for a consulting company called Testable. What we do is we go into other companies that already have their established development teams and we're all experienced engineers that can fit into the team and help you work on whatever it is you're trying to work on at the time. Our goal from doing that is to, of course, help you deliver whatever it is you're trying to deliver, but also to do some coaching on how to do remote work. We're a fully remote company, so we help companies that are trying to make a transition over to doing that. We help companies with agile practices and with testing practices to help them better deliver code in the future. And like I said, we try to just be really nice with everyone we interact with. So if that sounds like people you'd like to work with, uh, you can go ahead and go to test double slash contact to ask us what that would look like for your company. Or if that sounds like someplace you'd like to work at, uh, I'd love to have you as my coworker. So you can go to testdouble.com slash join. Thank you all very much for joining. I hope you have a great time at the rest of this conference and come say hi to me if you see me around. Thanks. Yeah.